Welcome, everyone. We will let folks make their way in from the waiting room and we will get started in just a moment. Welcome, welcome. Thank you to everyone joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, Exploring Landscapes, Connecting a Wildlife Refuge to a Three-Generation Maine Black Family. And thank you to everyone who's watching this recording. If you are watching on YouTube, please go ahead and click that little thumbs up button to like this video and help Maine conservation voters continue to offer programming like this. Today, Caesar Pond and the surrounding wetlands and upland forest area are the centerpiece of a state-managed wildlife refuge in Bowdoin, Maine. But from the late 1700s through the early 1900s, the area was home to a free Black family who lived and farmed there for three generations. The small rural town of Bowdoin is in the news and on our minds this week not for the environmental and social history that we'll explore together today, but for the shootings there and in Yarmouth. Our hearts go out to all communities affected by violence and especially to the communities of Yarmouth and Bowdoin, which include this week's speaker. Eileen Sylvan Johnson teaches Geographic Information Systems or GIS at, in the Environmental Studies Program at Bowdoin College. She's using GIS, which is a form of computerized mapping, to uncover the history of the Freeman family, and especially of the Freeman women. Reconstructing their lives is particularly challenging, but Professor Johnson's approach, using a geographical lens rather than a genealogical one, is unlocking their stories. My name is Kathleen Neal. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Since 2020, this weekly online Lunch and Learn series has helped us advance all of those goals, creating a shared space to explore Maine's environmental and social history, policy priorities, climate action movement, and more. A few notes before we dig in. We will hear from Professor Johnson first and then tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You can send your questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you, and I'll compile them, synthesize the ones with the similar themes, and make sure we can ask as many as possible following the presentation. We ask that you not message our speaker directly, as we wanted to be able to focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak, and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous programs. They're also all on YouTube, where we have a bunch of playlists that can help you focus in on particular topics. Thank you again for joining us and Professor Johnson, I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> Because we were talking about this before, I will already, I will say my dog will be barking in the background. So we love special guests. <laughs> well, he is going to be one of them. So um, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen now. And um, hopefully you're seeing a lovely picture of the wildlife refuge. Um, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, as we heard, my talk explores the history of the wildlife refuge and uh, traces the story of a three-generation Black family, the Freemans, who settled on the refuge and farmed area in and around the refuge from the late 1790s to about 1900. 
In tracing this history through geographic lens, my hope is to contribute to important work on celebrating the lives of Black Mainers and uncovering their histories and connections to the landscape of the region. Landscapes hold the threads of many stories and tracing these stories has allowed me to find other important pieces of Maine's history that I'll be sharing with you. But first I wanna start by acknowledging the work of so many others who have been critical in my explorations. I'll be including a list of references at the end for more information. I'd like to start by thanking former Representative Ger Gerald Talbot and his co-author Harriet Price who wrote the book Maine's Visible Black History and was the first step for me in tracing the story of the family who lived on the refuge. Bob Green, journalist and historian and a descendant himself of the Freeman family, research, has researched the history of the Freemans and other Black Mainers and generously shared his research. Dr. Randolph Stakeman, Professor Emeritus of Africana Studies and History. His paper on the Black population of the Maine, 1764 to 1900, was also very helpful in providing context. I'd like to thank Dr. Kate McMahon at the National Museum of African American History and Culture is presented as part of this Lunch and Learn series. And I, I encourage you to watch her talks. Um, Angela Wheeler and her husband, Reuben Wheeler of the Bowdoin Historical Society have been gathering resources on the history of the town of Bowdoin. And Angela is, I would say, the local expert on the history of the Freemans in Bowdoin. I'll include a link to the website for the Historical Society and encourage you to connect with her to learn more about her work. Dr. Amy Keithen of the Pajep Scott Historical Society helped me find key documents. And Dr. Sarah McMahon, Professor Emeritus of History at Bowdoin College, generously helped me interpret those documents. And most recently, I've enjoyed a collaboration with Jim St. Pierre, who presented on Caesar Freeman, the first family member I'll be discussing today for the Jeff Scott Historical Society. And I encourage you to watch his presentation. Finally, I have to acknowledge my field assistant, my husband, who accompanied on many walks around the wildlife refuge as I mapped stone walls and looked at maps and deeds, helped me read and interpret documents, and also provided a number of the photos included in this presentation. So nestled in the inland town of Bowdoin, Maine, the Caesar Pond Wildlife Refuge is a 600 acre forested area named for the pond, Caesar Pond, a 60 acre shallow pond within the refuge. To understand the history of the refuge, I first need to acknowledge that the Caesar Pond Wildlife Refuge is located on the traditional land of the Wabanaki peoples. And to help provide context, I'm showing the location of the wildlife refuge in yellow on the Native Lands Project Atlas. I've included the link in this image. The Native Land Project is a Canadian non-profit Indigenous-led organization that provides information on historical lands of Indigenous peoples, including the Wabanaki, and I encourage you to explore this resource. The Wildlife Management Area was established in 1988 when the state purchased 500 acres from the estate of Charles Dorian and Edward Grant. An additional 106 acres was donated by the Town of Bowdoin in 2006. Dorian and Grant managed the land for forest products for the sawmill in Livermore. In 1955, around the time of this image, Maine Inland Fish and Wildlife noted that the pond was shallow and the experimental introduction of largemouth bass was largely unsuccessful as no fish were detected by 1963. But over time, reforestation as ecological value led to its establishment as a wildlife refuge. Today, the Wildlife Refuge is a relatively unknown gem, but popular with area residents who enjoy fishing and skating and boating on the pond, including myself, and who make use of a network of recreational trails for hunting, hiking, skiing, and snowmobiling. A large stocking pond for trout supports active ice fishing in the winter, and there's a year-round fishing for largemouth bass. And if you're not able to explore Caesar Pond, really the next best thing is this nature blog by Lori and Drew Haynes. And I see Lori has joined us. Thank you, it's lovely to see you and has chronicled the natural history of the site for over a decade, including the documenting the arrival of last year's newest residents, two loon checks. I've included the link and I absolutely encourage you to check it out, it's amazing. So early research by the Bowdoin Historical Society and others links the name of the pond and hence the refuge itself to an early settler of Bowdoin, Caesar Freeman, a free black man who settled in the area around the late 1700s with his family. Tradition has it that Caesar may have been one of the original settlers of Bowdoin, Maine. By examining the history of three generations of the Freeman family and connections to the current wildlife refuge, my research describes the inextricable link between Maine's history and its current land uses. In the late 1700s, seven, several members of the Freeman family purchased land in and around the location of the wildlife refuge, establishing farms that persisted for multiple generations. Some of the descendants of the family are buried in a nearby cemetery. 
In my talk, I focus most closely on the women of the family whose stories were harder to uncover in part because their names are not listed in the earliest census and later because of limited property rights, their names are not listed on deeds. What I found is that the Freeman women who lived on the farms in the community in many cases outlived their husbands and may have had more limited opportunities because of their status, but persisted raising families, sending their sons off to fight in the civil war and kept the family farms going for over a 100 year period. What we know about Caesar Freeman is that he married Lydia Freeman in 1774 at this church in Ipswich. And at the time, both Caesar and Lydia <clears throat> were free blacks as indicated on the record of marriage. Lydia Freeman was originally from Ipswich and she was the daughter of Peter and Jane Freeman, likely slaves themselves, but at some point during their lives were freed and owned property in Ipswich. They had five children, Jane, Jenny, Peter, John, and Lydia. After their marriage, Caesar and Lydia moved to Lindenboro, New Hampshire, where they owned 130 acres of land. And at the same time, a Samson Freeman purchased land there as well. And there's some evidence that Caesar and Samson may have been related. In 1784, Lydia and her siblings sold their parents' home in Ipswich. The deed lists the residence of each of the family members shown here. And at the time, Lydia's siblings were all living in Maine, in the vicinity of Bowdoin, which may have been what brought Caesar and Lydia to Maine. As of the 1790 census, there were a total of 538 free persons in Maine. And, and according to the census, we're talking primarily about free Blacks out of a total population of a little under 100,000. Of these 538 free persons, only 140 are listed as members of households headed by all other free persons. And again, that was a census reference like, typically for free Black Mainers. The 1790 census reports that Caesar Freeman headed a family of eight. A second Freeman household headed by Samson Freeman was a family of five. And Bowdoin at that time would have had the greatest number of all the free persons of any town in Lincoln County. Tax records a few years later show that three Freemans are listed as owning, owning property in Bowdoin, John Freeman, Peter Freeman, and Samson Freeman. So I first learned about <clears throat> this story from my daughter's third grade teachers. And I wanna recognize these individuals. Um, around 2020, during the pandemic, I started researching the story behind the story, recognizing that many others had compiled a wealth of information on the Freeman family. But I was curious how Caesar Freeman had come to reside in Bowdoin, how the pond had come to be named for him, and it would be possible to determine where he and his family may have lived. I found partial answers to these questions and I hope that walking through this presentation, I can contribute how geography may help us to uncover some answers to these questions. So reconstructing the history of Caesar and Lydia Freeman's farm, where it was located and their descendants farms required the integration of historical documents, deeds and maps, collections in the data collection in the field, current property information and modern mapping technology called remote sensing. I'm gonna go through this next kind of geeky part pretty quickly, but I'm happy to answer more questions on it um, in the Q&A. So it started with field collection of the location of stone walls on the wildlife refuge, um, which provided insight on historic boundary lines. Starting with the current boundary line to the refuge, I collected the locations of walls. And you can see here, these points are places that I collected locations of beginnings and endings of walls. So it's a big refuge, a um, lot of stone walls. And so what I then turned to is remote sensing data, which allowed me to kind of take a look at some of the threads and, and signatures of um, these land uses in the form of stone walls, which you can see over here um, and see a foundation. I thought perhaps I'd found the Freeman farm, but this is not the Freeman farm. Um, stone walls are, are hard to pick up. Um, Sometimes they're very well defined, sometimes not so much, but the combination of going out and walking in the wildlife refuge and using the sorts of technologies I teach with, I was able to trace the lines of these stone walls and start to see where the locations of the historic farms might have been. So the next part of the story was to turn to the person who sold land originally to Caesar and John Freeman, Willis Hall. Willis Hall sold land to John and Caesar Freeman. We know it's in 1794. He sold um, land in lots of 90 acres, and there's a reference to lots two and three for a total of 100 acres that they owned, and that these were a subset of some other land that Willis Hall had owned, and that these lots ran from east-west. 
the descriptions help me understand a little bit more about where the Freeman Farm might have been. So I decided to look a little bit more into the story of Willis Hall to see if that would help uncover a little bit about what had brought them to this particular location. And what I learned was that Willis Hall was born in 1733 in Medford, Mass. Served as a city clerk for the city of Medford, which raised the question, how did Willis Hall come to own land in Bowdoin, Maine? And understand part of that story, it's important to know more about Hall's connections to certain individuals, including Isaac Royal, James Bowden, for whom the town and Bowden College is named, and other uh, <clears throat> wealthy New Englanders referred to as the Kennebec proprietors. Isaac Royal, a slave owner and loyalist, resided in Medford, Mass, where his home was the site of the largest number of, I've heard, um, and I need to document this, the largest number of slaves in one household north of the Mason-Dixon line. His home is now a museum. Um, sort of uh, reflecting the important history that we need to reflect on um, and what this represents. But as a loyalist at that time, he fled um, at the start of the revolution, leaving his estate in the care of his friend, Willis Hall, who was appointed executor of his estate. And in his will, Isaac Royal included a codicil that he left his daughter, uh, Mary Royal Irving, and I quote, <clears throat> my Negro woman, Belinda, in case she does not choose her freedom. If she does choose her freedom to have it, provided that she gets security that she shall not be a charge to the town of Medford. So in other words, at the time of his passing, Belinda had the choice to choose her freedom. And in 1783, Belinda chose freedom and petitioned the Massachusetts State Legislature for a pension from her former enslaver, Isaac Royal, in the first documented case of reparations. The Massachusetts legislator responded to the petition by awarding her 15 pounds and 12 ounces from the Royals estate to be paid on an annual basis. The payment stopped after the first year resulting in a second petition to the legislature in 1787. This well-known document referred to as Belinda's petition. Um, the legislator responded again that the payment needed to be made and Belinda was forced one more time around 1790 to petition again with the legislature ordering that the payment continue but no further information is known about Belinda after 1790. <clears throat> As Medford Town Clerk, Executive of Royals Estate, Willis Hall, an important footnote in history. He and his son, Nath Hall, signed his witnesses on Belinda's 1787 petition. There's some evidence that he may have been paid for his services as executor, and perhaps these provided funded funds for him to purchase land in Maine, which brings us to how he came to purchase this land in Maine that was then sold to the Freemans. Um, <clears throat> in the mid 1700s, a significant amount of land in the vicinity of Bowdoin was owned by two groups of wealthy New Englanders, the Pajepscott proprietors and the Kennebec proprietors. Willis Hall was not one of the original proprietors, but he knew the proprietors, including James Bowden, and purchased land from at least one of the original Plymouth Company proprietors, Edward Goodwin. The original Plymouth patent derived its claim dating from 1629 when the New England Council had established a grant for the Plymouth colony. And this patent encompassed nearly 3 million acres and broadly described as extending on either 15 miles on either side of the Kennebec River. The original holders of the patent engaged in fur training with the Wabanaki during the 1640s, but later the patent was subsequently divided and sold and to a certain extent forgotten until discovery of the document, 1629 document by Samuel Goodwin, who located the original Plymouth County patent in a house in Rhode Island in 1744. Location of the document and establishment of the claim of the Plymouth patent referenced as the Kennebec proprietors played a decisive role in the difficult and hard story of the connections between the proprietors, the settlers, and the Wabanaki. And this history is told very eloquently by Ian Saxon in his 2019 book, Properties of Empire, Indians, Colonists, and Land Speculators on the New England Frontier. And I encourage you to um, take a look at his book. It, it tells a really important piece of the story um, of Maine. Edward Goodwin, brother Samuel Goodwin, received a land grant as part of this later land patent. The Kennebec Beck proprietor's claim is reflected in this map, <clears throat> which divides 15 miles on either side of the Kennebec River into numbered lots. What you can see um, are each of these lots have a number and names associated with them, and they extend about 15 miles. Lot six includes the description that is owned by Edward Goodwin, brother of Samuel Goodwin, um, and where the wildlife refuge rests within this particular lot. In 1777, Edward Goodwin sold his share 
to Willis Hall. And you can see in this deed here, a reference to um, Edward Goodwin's receiving the original patent and then selling this land to Willis Hall. So bringing us back to, the, to this idea that Willis Hall then turned and sold this land in 1794 to the Freemans um, <clears throat> and that they were 90 acres in size. Um, what we do know is that um, the, one of these original lots, this lot right here is still, we're able to trace it um, to current properties. This is lot number five and tracing eastward four, three, two, and one. What we see is that with their wildlife refuge, these lots two and three are where the Freeman, John Freeman and Caesar Freeman owned land, where John Freeman um, later sold the land to Caesar Freeman. Um, Caesar Freeman then with his wife, Lydia Freeman purchased an additional lot, lot one from Willis Hall. Lydia and Caesar would then sell the Western portion of their property. And then the last connection we see between Hall and Freeman is in 1819, Hall discharged a mortgage um, for lot one, this lot here, um, to Caesar Freeman. And the deed references where Caesar Freeman now lives. So very likely he and Lydia lived in this portion of the wildlife refuge adjacent to the pond. The last record we have of Caesar is land transactions in 1823. He does not appear on the um, 1830 census. And so we, likely he passed away during that time. Um, the same um, <clears throat> 1830 census lists a Henry Freeman with an older woman living in his household. So potentially Lydia Freeman. Um, and tracing the story of Lydia Freeman at this time is complicated by the fact that women were, were not listed on the census and um, based on their status, property rights for women at that time. Colonial laws established a system of property ownership for women that shifted from common laws in England to the present day. And these existence of these laws and the ways that individual rights differentiated women from men shaped our landscapes in ways that we can only see faintly traced on the landscapes themselves. Um, what's unclear is how these rights may have been impacted further by race. Um, at the passing of her husband, Caesar, Lydia Freeman retained dower rights, also referred to as the widow's third. By law, widows inherited one third of their husband's property. Dower rights were intended to provide a way of supporting a widow after her husband's passing. However, how widow could use her dower was established by her husband's heirs and shaped by existing probate court. At the time, widows could not sell or otherwise convey property. Um, and according to colonial law, 18th century husbands had control over women's property that she acquired during and before marriage. So in a deed transferring property from a Benjamin Hasey of Topsom to the town of Bowdoin, there is a reference. This is where we find a little bit more about Lydia Dower, Lydia Freeman, sorry, and her Dower and the, um, as referencing Dower in the lands of the late Caesar Freeman. The deed established that um, another deed in 1836, also references um, Lydia Freeman, allowing her to live on the lands as long as she is alive. Um, and this is the deed for this um, lots one and two. It's likely that she passed away shortly thereafter because Henry Freeman then sold um, one of these properties in 1837. So that ended um, the connection at that time of the Freeman family to this property that we've been looking at, however, um, right around that time, the second generation of the Freeman family was establishing new farms just to the northeast of the Lydia and Caesar Freeman farm. Jared and Jeremiah Freeman owned property. Um, <clears throat> after Lydia and Caesar had sold their land, Jeremiah sold his property. And a Jared Freeman sold land to Adam Freeman for $5. And it's likely they were related given how low the property how low that amount was. Um, and others who have done extensive research on the gene genealogy of the Freemans have indicated that Adam Freeman may have been the son of Caesar and Lydia Freeman. So Adam Freeman um, was born in 1785 and married Nancy Malcolm um, in around 1820. She was white. Um, they had seven children, all of whom were likely born on the farm. The daughters and sons married and settled in neighboring communities, the exception of James Freeman, who stayed and lived in Bowdoin. Jeremiah and, and Jared are, are, are connected in some way. I'm not sure how, um, but I've included them as members of the Freeman family who likely lived on their wildlife refuge. So going back to the Adam Freeman farm, using a combination of looking at deeds and historic maps such as this one, um, 
and guided by the stone walls, I was able to identify that this AF refers to Adam Freeman and that this is the foundation of the Adam and Nancy Freeman farm that is currently on the wildlife refuge. The family lived on this farm from 1820 till at least the 1860s. Um, and although we don't have any pictures of the farm, what we do have is a picture of a farm nearby, the Townsend Farm, um, located right near the Freeman Farm. And you can see from this agricultural census that like the Townsend, the Freemans raised a range of livestock, milk cows, sheep, producing oats, corn, hay, and wood. Um, <clears throat> a few years later, two of the Freeman sons would fight in the Civil War. And at the time, it was unusual for black soldiers to serve in white regiments, but both sons who served, served separately in white regiments. Moses Dennett Freeman served in the second Maine Cavalry and was promoted to Wagoner in 1864. There were only two black soldiers in the second Maine Cavalry, Moses Dennett and Oren Secco. Years later, after his death, um, in California, you can see on his tombstone that Freeman's um, still references his roles as a wagoner in the second name. A second son, Albion Freeman, um, mustered in the 8th Maine and died at the Battle of Cold Harbor. His name is included on the Civil War Monument in the, Civil, in the center of Bowdoin. And like his brother, he may have been one of very few black men serving in the White Regiment from Maine. As a free black man, and a third generation in the free black family. There's extraordinarily different implications for his serving in the Civil War. His death during the Civil War also had important impacts on his family back home in Bowdoin. After her son's death, Nancy Freeman petitioned the Department of War for her son's pension in 1869. Supporting documents include many letters from the community that provide insight on Albion's life and that of his parents, Adam and Nancy. Several letters support the petition were provided, including at the Board of Selectmen, um, indicating the importance of Albion to his family, a little bit more about his life. Also from the owner of this store here, who um, provides information on the, in the um, letters that he provided about the sorts of things that Albion would purchase at the store in town and about the, the family and Nancy and Adam and how important he had been for keeping the family going. It's unclear if this petition was successful. What we do know is that in around 1870, Nancy and Adam oops, moved to their um, family, their son's farm, James Freeman. James Freeman was the next generation. Um, he held this land in the wildlife refuge, but he likely, um, along with his wife, Ellen Freeman, they married in 1865 live somewhere in this part of Bowdoin. I have not mapped them because it's outside the refuge, but I, if you look at the um, deed for the refuge itself, it does reference the James Freeman farm. So the youngest son, James Freeman, and his wife, Ellen, farmed successfully for the next 10 years. Adam and Nancy would move at some point to be with one of their children in Brunswick, where they would pass and be buried in the Varney Cemetery in Brunswick, Maine. So about 10 years later from this point, um, James Freeman died very young from heart disease at the age of 40. And on the death of her husband, Ellen Freeman continued to own the farm for a few more years um, and to care for her three children, Robert, Sarah, and Vesta. Although 30 years earlier, Maine had passed one of the most liberal laws protecting women's property rights, this did not apply if a husband died without a will. Existing law present prevented women from being the agents of their husband's wills in these cases. In the cases where a man died without a will, Maine law established the rights of his widow to receive an allowance and that an appointed administrator was responsible for arranging for the payment of that allowance. And these laws had a critical impact upon the Freeman family upon passing of James Freeman. As James Freeman had died without a will, Sagadaw County Probate Court appointed an administrator of James Freeman's estate. Six years after his death, the probate file provides, again, an insight into their, their lives um, by inventorying real estate and personal property. What you can over, see over here is actually a reference to the Adam Freeman farm that was still owned by the family and provides for an allowance for his widow. Um, from this documents, it looks that um, James Freeman, along with being a farmer, might have been a carpenter. The record further authorized the court appointed administrator to sell the Freeman family 
to Ellen Freeman. So Ellen Freeman then purchased her family from the um, administrator, essentially from the estate. Further, at the time, Maine law required that women petition the courts for guardianship of their own children at the passing of their husband. So at that time, Ellen Freeman petitioned for guardianship of her children, Robert, Abigail, and Vesta. As you can see here, the, the guardianship petition for Vesta. Ellen continued to own her property in Bowdoin on the James and Ellen family farm located to the northeast of the pond. The final land, tra land transfer related um, was a mortgage in 1900 to a Fannie Delaware for the price of $25. But a little bit earlier than that, um, Ellen Freeman had sold the Adam Freeman farm, the one that's located on the wildlife refuge. She continued to be listed as living in Bowdoin, but it's likely that around that time, late 1800s by 1900, um, she had moved to Lewiston to start a position as a cook. Um, Ellen's children moved to the area communities, Lewiston and Brunswick. And for the last 38 years of her life, Ellen Freeman worked as a cook in the home of this individual, Wallace Humphrey White. Um, Wallace's father-in-law, is also listed as living with a family, William Pierce Fry. And um, William Pierce Fry, former Senator for the state of Maine, served very briefly in an unofficial capacity as the Vice President of the United States just prior to and after the assassination of President McKinley. Ellen Freeman is listed in Lewiston on the census as being Black in 1900. She's listed again in 1910 as Black, but interestingly, in 1920, she's listed as living in this household and is listed as being white. I'm not sure why, but it, it's an interesting um, question. Um, shortly before her death, Ellen Freeman moved to be with her daughter in Brunswick. And upon her death, she was buried in the cemetery not far from the Freeman farm along with her son who had died before her and her husband. The last member of the family to have lived on the Freeman farm, Vesta Freeman is buried in a nearby cemetery in Bowdoin along with her brother, father, and mother. Oral tradition holds that Caesar Freeman and his wife Lydia are also buried but without a headstone to mark their graves. Although the Freeman family genealogy is extensive and as I mentioned, so many others have done inc incredible work in terms of documenting their lives. These are the individuals that as far as I know who lived at one point or another in the town of Bowdoin and more specifically those in blue on the wildlife refuge itself. So it brings us back to Caesar Pond. And coming back to the early question of the name of Caesar Pond, it does seem that the name is connected to this early family of Bowdoin. Deeds, the property directly next to the pond, however, describe Caesar Pond as Little River Pond as late as 1850 connected to the Little River Stream, which finally finds its way into Lisbon Falls. But around 1860, deeds start referencing the pond as Caesar Pond. This is 30 years after Caesar Freeman would have passed um, and lived on the farm on the southern shores of the pond. So I wonder if the name reflects almost a deeper, longer term connection to this family that lived and farmed in the area, in the vicinity of the pond. What I've come to learn is that these landscapes that we explore and love <clears throat> is that they're touchstones to greater stories, to larger stories, and that the threads of these stories remain to perhaps teach us if, if we know where to look. For example, these walls, stone walls, now the way I look at them, I think about the fact that they represent the location of the Kennebec proprietors and what that means. That this site of a three generation black family, Caesar Pond, also reflects a larger story of women's rights and how existing rights influenced the ways in which women were able to keep property. From Lydia Freeman, whose parents were slaves, what lived her husband, but at his passing was not able to inherit his property, to Nancy Freeman, who petitioned for the right to receive her son Albion's pension in order to keep her family farm. And finally, Ellen Freeman, who upon her husband's death needed to not only petition for the right to keep the farm, but also the right to remain as guardian for her three children. By weaving the nature and status of women who work the land and in particular of black women, the history of women and their contributions began to come to light. So how should we manage these places to reflect the history such as the one I've shared? It's actually something I look forward to exploring and thinking more about as to think of my children um, and the fact that they learned about this in their elementary school. So I hope we continue to tell these stories to our children in our classrooms. 
Um, my hope is to start conversations around this. I'm happy to connect with future collaborators if this is of interest. Um, I wanna thank the Maine Conservation voters, in particular, Kathleen, Will, and Maggie for the opportunity to share this work. Um, I also want to make sure that I share once again, the acknowledgements to the incredible people who have done a lot of great work in this area. A very short <laughs> list of resources. I'm happy to provide many more for those of you who are curious and I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. It is, what a fascinating, project this has been and what a, an incredibly interesting history you're you're uncovering. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that you will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with a bunch of those resources and and links to learn more. So if like me you are thinking, wow, I didn't know GIS could do all of this. Uh, there's a link to, the, you'll get this afternoon, a link to the OSHA map library at USM, which has just a whole host of exhibits and resources that you can explore in person or online. Uh, there's also information to help you connect with your local historical society and to go back and, and check out some of the other racial justice and equity themed programs that we have featured in this Lunch and Learn series. So the Place Justice Initiative, the Atlantic Black Box Project, um, we are really enjoying the learning that we're doing together on this. And so helping to, to package that up and help you uh, go back and put it all in context. So keep an eye out for that this afternoon. And as always, feel free to forward that email to anyone and everyone and spread the word. Uh, we already have a good list of questions and I'll encourage everyone to, to keep those coming through the chat. But the first thing that, that I want to know is, is this what GIS is for? Are you forging new ground here? Tell us, tell us a little bit more about this because I really didn't know you could do such interesting things with GIS. Um, oh, thank you. Well, I have to say that I, I don't know if I'm forging new grounds. I, uh, all of my work sort of rests on the shoulders of others, but um, I do teach this in classes. Um, and I think one of the things, that the power of this is that we can bring things together that we don't realize um, can tell us something about location and space. Um, whether it's like reading a deed and turning it into something on a map, or as I said, using this remote sensing to like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of stone walls. I don't know, have time to do all of them. And I can, I can use some of that information, but to bring it together and start to really uncover um, the stories that do have such a great geographic component and, and to have that complement, as I said, the incredible work that's been done earlier, I think is, you know, sort of one of the things that it can do. Thank you. That is, that's really, it's so interesting and, and does make me think of some of our previous conversations with, with folks you work with all the time, Meadow Dibble, Kate McMahon, who said, if you're exploring a cemetery and you see that somebody, somebody died far, far away from here, what's the story behind that? <laughs> and just all of those things of looking at the, the landscape and the, the clues that are all around us and how do we put them together to, to, figure out the stories and the, the history that we haven't always been been told. But I did love that piece that you said, you know, that your your kids have learned some of these stories. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you see as an educator that is is different today, perhaps with these tools, perhaps with other tools, uh, from from the way that perhaps you learned about them, that that I learned about them back in our day. Um, well, I'd like to say like for my students that, um, you know, it's a very powerful way to kind of tell stories in a, in a different way. I think people like to interact with maps. You can bring in, like I, I did historic maps um, that tell some really fascinating stories. Um, and it's a puzzle. It's like a, it's a cool puzzle to think about like, why is this person, why do they live here? And, and what does this tell us? And I mean, I remember like reading the Dower, like what's the Dower? Like, oh, a Dower, like trying to read things and understand them in order to kind of put them on a map. Um, 
But I think that, um, yeah, as I said, I appreciate that the the first time I heard about the story was that Bowdoin Historical Society would do a program with the third graders um, to help them understand the history of Bowdoin. And this is just a story that I only learned because of that originally. Um, so thank you. And thank you to those people who continue to do that great work. And I love that, that, that it was a third grade class that kind of set set the college professor on, yeah. on the learning path. That was many years ago, though. I have to say they're not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about how you got, got into this work. What else are you working on right now? Um, well, I do a lot of work on climate adaptation and uh, working with communities to help them sort of imagine their communities. Um, I do a lot of community-based work with my students. Um, where they can, you know, provide support for, for communities who need that. Um, so basically for a lot of community members who say like, there's a need to understand this is a map. I love to say like, okay, well, how can we help you do that? Um, but yeah, I've been focusing a lot on looking at community resilience and, and uh, adaptation. And I, I think part of what intrigued me about the story of this woman is like, talk about being really resilient to all these things that they experienced in their lives and how important it is just to, really understand and learn and, and for me to be inspired by like I can't I can't imagine it in the lens that I have but I can truly be inspired by the little that I was able to learn about them um, over this time period and I don't I walk out in the wildlife refuge and I'm like I it's just not the same place for me anymore there's just so many incredible stories that I think about as I'm out there that is that is really interesting and makes me wonder about the, the role of, you know, is there a place for, for informational signs to like, when people explore, it, it, does that exist now? Is there signage in the, the refuge or is there a, a movement towards that? Uh, it's a great question. It's, um, there is a, a sign there. Um, and I, I know one thing I'd have offered to do is just to write something up, you know, um, for the wildlife management plan, if, you know, if this is of interest, I'm, I'm happy to share this. Um, you know, maybe there's some future opportunities, but I think even just sort of letting people know that are just out there exploring that, you know, this is kind of a, it's a cool place. It's a cool place for many, many reasons, um, but there is this really interesting history there. And what a different sort of lens to think about this is a this is an interesting place not just ecologically but historically and geographically and as a complex system like like all of our like all of our places right there are a lot of things going on um one of our our participants today is using gis in a folklore class and wonders if you have looked for any oral stories or or legends about family in the area are there other threads we can pull into this, this wonderful tapestry? Uh, that's a great question. I'm very excited and I'd love to connect with whoever that is. But um, yeah, so I um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of opportunities to integrate, um, you know, starting with a map, but also be able to bring in an oral history or, um, you know, images. And I think, you know, really I want to say I feel like this is the story of the freedmans themselves and as much as I can contribute to ways that it can help collection of those stories for their own family that that's an exciting thing to me but I love I love that idea and I, I think there's a lot of potential there for sure. Such a rich history that that we're everybody can sort of contribute a piece to. So let's go go deeper on the the refuge itself and the Freeman family. Um, do you have a sense of the density of the residences around the pond? You know, or I think you said cellar holes. Is that the, the primary indicator? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, certainly trying to, there, there's definitely some other um, family farms there. I came across them mostly in reading through the deeds of Bermidgeans is actually that one that I very beginning when I was zooming in and saying like, oh, maybe this is the Freeman family. He's a Bermudian family. Um, and I'm sure there's a whole history there. And, and I will say like, there's a lot of great information through the Bowdoin Historical Society. Um, Angela Wheeler's pulled together an amazing Facebook page. Really, you know, want people to check that out with the out images. And I've, you know, used a few of them in this um, presentation. So we know some of the stories and so the, the challenge and the interesting, like this really cool challenge is how can we locate them? I don't, I couldn't tell you the density of it because I know trying to find anyone, if 
foundation takes a while to figure out like where it actually it is because there's our foundation you know there's there's um homes that probably do not have foundations or I couldn't find them maybe someone else might be able to find them um but yeah I, I um I think it's a great question all many so many great questions to keep working on this <laughs> it, it's never done right this work is never done um Getting into the, the Freeman family for a moment, uh, was it Nancy Malcolm and Adam Freeman? Is that the couple that you talked about where the, the husband was black and the wife was white? Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what that meant for them in the, the early 1800s. Was there a stigma or? That's a great question. And actually, um, you know, I do want to acknowledge um, Dr. Kate McMahon, who when I first had some conversations with him, I think, I believe it's right, and I don't want to miss Quoter, but I, I feel like at some point when we were talking about this, um, Maine passed a law, I believe in the 1821, which essentially legalized interracial marriage. So up until then, and it was right around the time, I believe, I don't I don't have an actual date of when they were married, but it would have been around that time. Um, and I and I believe, and again, I would have Kate McCann sort of <laughs> explain this better, is that you know in rural communities, it may not have mattered in the same way, like it was you were in the community. Um, but I don't know for sure, but I, I do know that I believe it was around 1821 where there was a law that was passed where it actually was legal to marry. And there were several family members, um, one of the daughters of James um, and um, Ellen Freeman married actually the boy next door who was white um, and they lived in Topsom together. It's just fascinating to, you know, that the reality doesn't always match up with what our expectations might might have been for what what their life was like. So thank you. That's really interesting. Um, and did you say are there Freeman descendants still in the Bowdoin area now? I believe so. And I know I mentioned uh, um, Jim St. Pierre gave a really nice talk about Caesar Freeman for the Punjab Scott Historical Society recently. It's a great talk, and I really encourage people to to check that out. And I believe that there's a number of individuals, and there may be some here um, who are descendants who live in the area. Um, and and I think you know that for um, Mainers who've been here for eight generations, I think there's a fair number who could actually trace them, their family back to the Freemans. And again, there's a lot of Freemans that lived in in Brunswick in the area, and I and that's not an area I myself am an expert on. I'm not a genealogist, but I it was important having that genealogy. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there's some of the resources I included um, do have extensive information on these families. I did a little bit of, of Googling before, before we met and <laughs> just make sure it, and it was actually kind of hard to find information about the, the Caesar Pond wildlife refuge. And I'm wondering why that might be and and whether there is any effort to, you know, to really foreground that connection between the natural history and the, the human history, you know, because I think in my in my extensive Googling, <laughs> the first thing that came up was was that reference that you you shared about there are no fish in the pond. And <laughs> moving on. So there's obviously a lot more to know about it. Yeah, and I think, well, I think like in any public space, there's, you know, the environmental histories of these areas, um, you know, and again, I'm more of a geographer than a historian, but environmental historians would say like, you know, any of these spaces have these longer histories that are really important to understand in general, always, but also tell a little bit about like, why, why is this looking this way? Why do we see this, you know? Um, there's a lot of things I've been really curious about the wildlife refuge in terms of its historical land uses. You know, was it a good place to farm? Was that part of the challenges and why the family didn't persist? I, I, I would have to um, turn to colleagues who have a lot more extensive experience as historians to really answer that. But, um, but I think that there's just a lot of opportunities for uncovering some of these important stories. This is just one. I'm sure there's a, a many, many more. Out there. So hopefully I've inspired people to kind of go out and look, you know, in their own communities for some of these stories. And, the, and work is happening and really is the resources in, that you'll send out show. Um, just want to, you know, 
call out those individuals that really are doing great work to uncover these stories. You are inspiring folks. I am alarming folks by saying that there were no fish in the pond. Is that <laughs> still true? Fact check me, please. <laughs> I, I, um, I know that there are fish and, and I do not fish myself, um, sadly, but when I, I do ski and skate and I, I always ask people who are out of the pond what they're catching and, and there's a lot of people out there who really enjoy ice fishing um, and I, I think, yeah, I, I would say so. But again, there may be somebody else on here who could really speak more to the fisheries part. So that it. was a moment in time and needs to be, moment needs to be updated. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think it's like, it just shows that, you know, in general, like, right, water quality in Maine has improved and and um, it is a shallow pond. So, um, but again, I'll, I'd turn to the fishery biologist to be able to talk a little bit more about sort of the pond itself in that context. What advice do you have for, for folks heading out this, you know, it's going to be a beautiful weekend, at least I'm, I'm hoping so. And what advice do you have for, for people to pick a place um, if they wanted to get started on a project like this? Well, I think just be curious, right? Just, you know, I think that's where I started being curious and um, <clears throat> just you know, starting to look like, why are there walls there? What does that mean? You know, are there, there's a lot of um, really great resources that can help um, interpret if you're seeing a certain type of, you know, um, forest here, it might mean something else um, that has been there in the past. And I think just that curiosity can help us feel more connected and can help us kind of uncover these stories. But yeah, I would start with that. Just like, why, why is this way? You know, why is it this way? Why do we see this particular forest here and not there? And, um, and, and so that's what I would start with. And I would, I would um, also encourage to connect with historical societies as well, who often do have amazing um, troves of resources to explore. Um, and, and sometimes just kind of putting these things together. Here's some right images and here's the here's the location. Um, but that's sort of where I would start, I guess. Thank you so much for for sharing your expertise and your research and and your story. Um, we are we are all all the richer for it. So I'm really grateful um, that you joined us this week and that we know a little bit more about the uh, the wildlife refuge that we we did and and how much more there is to learn so um, everybody should keep an eye out for that follow-up email that you'll get later this afternoon um, have please 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 keep us posted if you if you take us up on any of those links and resources and go out and find the stories uh, in your community, we would love to hear about what you uncover and and let us know if uh, if you maybe the next lunch and learn is is yours. So um, we will be back in this space next week to learn about the main climate core, which adds human resources to move the climate action strategies forward and to help meet the goals of Maine's climate action plan. So we'll have the climate core coordinator, Kristen Brewer with us, and she'll tell us a little bit about Maine's climate core, the, the triple bottom line of service, which is addressing the climate crisis, providing training and experience to those who serve, and increasing community resilience through volunteerism. Um, should be a really interesting program. Hope to see you all there and can't wait to hear about your stories of exploring the history of our natural areas. Thank you, Professor Johnson. Thanks to all of you and have a fabulous weekend.